Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session 20. In this Law Society of Ireland recording, Anya Hines talks to Justin Purcell and provides an update on capacity law in practice. So you're all very welcome to uh, Small Practice uh, Information session 20, updates on capacity law in practice with Anya Hines. Uh, so you're very welcome to the, to, to the information session, Anya. Uh, we're delighted to have you. Uh, and I think we'll get started now that it's one o'clock. So I'll, I'll just formally introduce you. So Anya is a, a, a partner in St. John's Solicitors specializing in disability and mental law. She chairs the Dublin DSBA Mental Health and Capacity Committee and is a vice chair of the Law Society. Mental Health and Capacity Task Force. She is also a former president of the DSBA and is a council member of the Law Society. And this is the bit we're really excited about. Onya is one of the first solicitors appointed senior counsel and was presented her patent of precedence in the Supreme Court on the 9th of October 9th, uh, 2020. So a huge congratulations for us all. It's a real privilege for us to have you on the, on the information session today, Onya. So, so I'm delighted. So we're gonna be covering a, a wide range of topics uh, from wardship to assisted decision-making to the Lunacy Regulation Act of 1871, which, which kind of sparked my interest, and uh, the end of life uh, decisions and how, how they come about. So, which is a very popular, or not popular, but topical uh, uh, matter at the moment. So, so over to you, Anya. If anyone has any questions, please, please send them up on the chat. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And uh, uh, a big round of applause for Anya. So, great. Thanks for Thank coming. You. Thank you very much, Justin, for the kind introduction. Um, so I should just warn the audience that I have, uh, I'm technically challenged and I do hope that I don't manage to shut this all down or show you some of my holiday snaps or something like that. So I'm normally not allowed loose <laughs> when I go down to the Law Society to deliver a lecture. Usually somebody stands by my side to help me move the slides from one to the other. So uh, at the outset, I apologize if, um, I, can't, if, if I make some technical mistake um, so that's the first thing I'd like to, to say. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is that uh, there's qu there are quite a lot of slides uh, provided to you today. Now, I'm not intending to go through all of the slides, so you can relax, sit back, enjoy your lunch, don't get indigestion or a heart attack when you see them, or think that I'm going to keep you here till three o'clock, because I promise I won't. Um, the slides are there for information. And I hope there's, um, you know, there's practical material on it that you can take with you. But there are certain things I'm, I'm not going to delve into today. Um, and before I go any further, I want to thank Justin and the Law Society for inviting me to do this. Um, it's, it's, it's an unusual format, and I hope I, I sort of don't break anything. So in terms of what I'd like to cover, um, I think... We could all agree that um, at the moment, capacity law is really an area in huge flux, there's huge change. And I think people are quite confused about what statutory regime are we operating under? Is the Assisted Decision Making Act in? Are we allowed to use wardship? Um, what's happening in wardship? So, um, that's, they're, they're the kind of broad strokes that I hope to be able to assist with today. I'm going to, um, I'll just go on to the next slide. And again, this is where the test is, if I can manage to do the next slide. Yes. We're, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I will cover, just to give you an update on the implementation of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act, where it's at and what sections are in and when we think it might come in. And then um, I'm going to do an update on current practice and what's going on in the wardship lists. Um, I'm, I have provided practice direction to you, which is very recent, 5th of October, on the contact, contents of medical reports and um, an update on some recent Supreme Court decisions. Now, I'll do my best to cover that in the time that we have, but fear not, if I don't cover it all, you will have the slides. Um, I think you probably all know that um, the Assist Decision-Making Capacity Act is a response to 
Ireland's obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And the purpose of the UN Convention is to ensure that persons with disabilities um, have equal access to justice and enjoy life um, to the full and that there are no, um, there's nothing to, I suppose, impede that so that they can live li life equally and to their full potential. So that's really the, um, I suppose, the ethos behind the convention. Um, in terms of our position, the UNCRPD was adopted on the 13th of December 2006. And um, we, it was anticipated that we would be ratifying it with the Assisted Decision Making Act, once that came into force. Now that isn't in force, there's just small sections of it in force. But um, on the 7th of March, 2018, we were the last state in the EU, EU that hadn't yet ratified it. So we the government uh, basically passed an, a motion to ratify the UN CRPD on the 7th of March, 2018. Now it didn't um, adopt the optional protocol, it hasn't uh, ratified that. The optional protocol is an instrument which allows individuals and groups of individuals to take a complaint to the UNCRPD in the case of an alleged violation of the rights. So certain uh, disability groups have, of course, expressed some frustration around that. Um, so we have officially ratified the uh, convention. But in terms of the uh, Assisted Decision Making Act itself, there have uh, just been two commencement orders. Um, there's the commencement order in 2016, which commenced um, part, part one, other than sections three, four and seven, and then part nine, other than section um, sections uh, 102 and chapter three. So I'll, I'll go on to tell you what they are, what they're about. The parts, uh, the sections of part one that have become operative deal with interpretation and expenses and don't deal with the substantive elements of part one uh, dealing with the principles. So I think a lot of people think that because some of part one is in, that means that all of part one is in and it's not. So the principles of the Assist Decision Making Act are not yet commenced. Um, and the functional approach to capacity test is not yet commenced. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be uh, trying to approach capacity on a functional basis. Um, and then the important part really that was established is part nine, which deals with the establishment of the new role of the Director of Decision Support Services. And Anya Flynn um, was appointed and commenced her role in October 2017. And at that point in time in 2017, I got a lot of congratulations for my appointment to the, to the roles. Myself and Anya get confused quite a bit um, and it's great when we lecture together on the same stand because we're like that's one Anya and this is the other Anya so I think I'm anyway so just to congratulate Anya on her appointment but that's that's a substantive uh, part that has been commenced and it just allows her to start her role but there is a, a huge uh, amount left to do um, I'm not going to go through this slide in full but I think the latest estimates are, uh, well, there's legislation yet to be, the legislation is going to be amended. There's going to be another part 13 added on deprivation of liberty. And there are a draft, uh, a whole raft of legislative amendments proposed to the current form of the 2015 Act, which have yet to be, um, I think, I don't think they've, I'm not sure if they've been drafted, but there's, there's a long way to go. There's also a long way to go in setting up um, I suppose the IT systems and the back, uh, the infrastructure required to deal with um, register new registrations of enduring powers of attorneys and advanced healthcare directives. So there's, there's a huge, huge amount more to do. So I think the latest is um, 2023. Um, so don't quite quote me on that, but I'd, I'd seen recently that that uh, is the potential anticipated time frame for commencement. So um, I suppose, where are we at then while we wait for the Assisted Decision Making Act? I think a lot of people, as I said, thought that it might be in force um, and you know, the more substantive sections were in force, but they're not. And we have to deal with um, capacity 
uh, every day in our practices. We're dealing with people who want to make their enduring power of attorneys. Um, and we're dealing with clients who are vulnerable, who are elderly, who are making wills. And you know, we have to be, we have to obviously deal with those issues within the current legal framework. So we're all familiar with um, EPAs. Um, there is also a mechanism to uh, apply to court under inherent jurisdiction. If we need to have um, a decision made for a person who's not capable of making that decision themselves, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But the primary uh, legislation and, and our current capacity legislation is the 1871 Act and uh, the Supplemental Courts 1961 legislation, which I'll go on to cover in, in a moment. In terms of inherent jurisdiction, um, a lot of applications were made to court um, for, say, urgent treatment orders. There was, they weren't made under any particular legislative framework, um, but the court was making them to um, defend personal rights guaranteed under the constitution. Um, and there were a lot of orders made for persons who weren't able to make decisions for themselves under inherent jurisdiction. And I suppose inherent jurisdiction went so far as to um, the, the courts were being asked to make orders to detain people. But this wasn't within a statutory framework, it's under inherent jurisdiction. The principle relevant, uh, principles that are relevant to the proper exercise of this inherent jurisdiction is that the court's inherent jurisdiction should be exercised only insofar as is necessary. And it shouldn't be invoked where there's a satisfactory and existing regime available for dealing with the issue. Um, and then in FD, which is a Supreme Court case 2015, Lafoy um, gave a judgment which uh, I suppose uh, focused uh, practitioners' minds on whether or not inherent jurisdiction should be used. Um, and her findings essentially were that um, were that this was the issues of capacity are dealt with um, under the uh, 1871 Act and by virtue of subsection 9 of the Act of 1961. So therefore that is the uh, incapacity legislation and that is what should be used. Um, and she went on to say, neither the nature of the High Court's judicial function nor its constitutional role in the administration of justice, in my view, permits the recognition of an inherent jurisdiction in the High Court to make provision for the protection of persons with mental incapacity outside the wardship process. So in a sense, this was, I suppose, contracting back in the um, use of inherent jurisdiction and saying, look, we really should be using the statutory regime that's available to us. And um, obviously there are concerns around wardship and the fact that it is a, a very old piece of legislation that has been uh, amended obviously by the 61. I go on to, to describe the actual legislation to you in a moment. There are concerns that it's archaic and that it shouldn't be used. And there was a, a real reluctance to use it. And also um, I think quite a lot of people were waiting for the um, Assisted Decision-Making Act to come in and didn't want to use it. But that then provides gaps when something urgent is required for a person. So um, we don't have the Assisted Decision-Making Act. We're being asked really not to use uh, inherent jurisdiction. So, um, and when President Kelly took over uh, the wardship list in 2015, um, he noted the decision of Lafoy and noted inherent jurisdiction should not be used where there is a statutory regime. So he asked practitioners and lawyers to stop making applications under inherent jurisdiction. Um, some of the rationale around that is that if a person is made a ward of court, there are records in relation to it. There is a regime. There is certainty about what's happening. The person's monies are protected. Um, so there, there are some benefits just uh, in terms of using the statutory regime that's already there. So the legislation is the 1871 Act and the Courts uh, Supplemental Provisions Act, Section 9, that's best the jurisdiction. Um, the 
the next slide just shows that the word lunatic uh, isn't to be used anymore. Obviously, it's quite um, archaic language and it's offensive to us now. But um, the original meaning was actually a scientific term, don donating, um, which basically says that somebody um, has fluctuating capacity. That's its originating term, comes from the moon, but it was a scientific term. But it has become offensive and it shouldn't be used. And um, in the uh, 61 Act, it was, um, sorry, the provisions, it was amended to say that the expression should be a person of unsound mind and not a lunatic. Um, so in terms of the tests, it is that a person is of unsound mind and incapable of managing his or her affairs. Uh, but you also have to consider whether or not it is appropriate and necessary to make the person of order court. There may be um, another way of dealing with the situation that presents itself. So obviously, if a person has an EPA, you, you have recourse to that if they've lost capacity. So you don't automatically, just because a person is of unsound mind and incapable of managing uh, his or own person and affairs doesn't automatically mean you should rush into wardship. Um, and there was a question as to whether or not wardship was only to be used for a person's property. And I think as solicitors um, are now active for the HSC, but you, know, you might be trying to get an application in uh, to deal with the person who um, had, who was in difficulty, um, where they was maybe suffering from self-neglect or they're a person with a disability who are being sexually abused in their homes. Um, very, very serious issues um, and also then treatment issues, um, maybe somebody with anorexia nervosa. Um, and the question was whether or not those uh, cases could be brought before the courts under wardship because the people generally didn't have very much money. Um, but it is the case that um, you don't have to, it just isn't all about the money. It is that the person themselves may require protection. And most of the cases that are heard now before the president, president of the High Court relate to the protection of the person. Um, they're to meet the safeguarding concerns and the HSE policy and the safeguarding policy. Um, again, going back to those kind of issues where the HSE might be dealing with a disability case and somebody is in danger in their home and they have to be protected. So uh, we would then proceed to court and ask for urgent orders uh, to bring the person into wardship. And in the interim, orders are obtained under the wardship jurisdiction um, to enable the, per the HSE and the police to take that person out of their home and to bring them somewhere safe. So that is really where um, you know, the majority of cases that are before the courts at the moment, um, they deal with protecting the person themselves. And they're used, um, I, I don't know the exact statistics, but um, the majority of cases that I see before the courts are to protect persons who are at risk and they're adult persons. And there's no other um, legislation available to us except wardship. Um, this is the legislative framework which is set out here. But the interesting thing is currently that uh, President Kelly uh, dealt with this list and um, he was very open and receptive to having uh, applications made to protect persons with disabilities or um, um, elderly persons who had lost the ability to manage themselves or mind themselves. He's very open to hearing those applications he um, also had, he allowed wards to attend court at any time. And there was always this thing called liberty to apply. So if you had a difficulty in the case, you could be come in with, within the, the next couple of hours sometimes to mention a problem that had arisen on a particular case. So it was a very open court um, to the extent that there was a huge number of cases and the wardship list would have generally just been heard on a Monday, but there are now basically it's been heard five days a week. And since uh, President Kelly retired, um, President Irvine and two other judges are managing that list. There's just quite a big volume of it. Um, the next couple of slides um, are the ones that will definitely uh, cause you indigestion and I will not go through them. Um, but it sets out the specifics of how to go about doing a wardship application. And you can read that at your leisure. 
Um, so bear with me a second. I, I suppose one of the features of the work in the wardship courts at the moment is that um, all of the practitioners and the judges are trying to apply um, a UNCRPD approach uh, and a proper safeguarding approach to the work. So um, many people who are objecting to wardship, they will be, um, be provided with a guardian at least to assist them in that objection. And if there is a detention element involved in any of the orders that are sought under wardship, those will be reviewed in accordance with best international practice. Um, so there really have been huge, um, I suppose huge improvements from a human rights perspective in the wardship arena. Um, so this is uh, the important new practice direction, uh, which is helpful in relation to um, affidavits and medical reports grounding wardship applications um, because some medical reports could be quite short, uh, two or three lines, person is of unsound mind and incapable of managing their affairs, and that's really not sufficient. Um, the, this is a, the contents of the medical um, reports have been set out in full, and I've set the link to it there, and it gives you guidance as to how to draft the affidavit. Um, but there's more information required regarding the scope of the examination and it also attempts to apply, again, a functional approach to assessing a person's capacity. And again, there are time limits there. Um, so they've become much more strict on the time limits. Now, in terms of the uh, reporting, the examination of the person, the reporting and the affidavit, uh, there is probably going to be some leeway on those timelines taking into account COVID and difficulties in getting um, medical affidavits sworn, but, um, you know, just to, just to bear it in mind, in ordinary times, it's quite, uh, quite tight. And I think one of the other points to make in relation to wardship is that it was considered one of the priority cases during complete lockdown. So, you know, the, we were going in almost every day to court making urgent wardship applications for protection for orders for protection of persons with disabilities or other urgent uh, treatment cases so it is um and it will i presume continue um again during this next lockdown um so the kind of applications that are made would be say a treatment uh, 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 cases dealing with treatment so we would have cases coming to us where somebody has gangrene. Um, now I, I was going to go into the, I, I won't give you any more details because you are eating your lunch. But <laughs> um, urgent amputation would be say required. And I know I've got an instruction, uh, I think it was the, yeah, the last day before Christmas um, where I got an instruction at four o'clock that urgent amputation, um, that there was gangrene and urgent amputation was required. And the person was in a delirium, God love them, and was refusing everything, um, which is fair enough as well, given the seriousness of what was required, but it was life threatening. And I think I got the instructions on three, at three o'clock while I was sitting in court in another urgent matter. And one of my colleagues took over the running of it and we were before the president at five o'clock getting orders for treatment and detention because that person was seeking to leave the hospital. He was pulling out tubes. It was really quite distressing. But, you know, this is the flexibility of uh, that has been brought into the jurisdiction that you can get instructions and within an hour or two be in court to get the relevant treatment orders required. And this case, EB, was a lovely case um, where this poor lady, she had um, a huge brain tumour uh, it was five centimetres. She was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and um, because she was exhibiting very strange behaviours and uh, when medical uh, examinations were done, it was discovered she had a massive brain tumour and that needed to be removed and she wanted to have acupuncture instead. But um, obviously she didn't have the capacity to make that decision. So all the various safeguards were put in place. She capacity tests were done and second medical opinions, I think, were also obtained. So all the right legal structures were put around it and 
she, uh, the president made an order that she, the surgery would go ahead. And then a couple of weeks later, she did really, really well. No, it might have been five weeks later, she came to court and she brought him a box of chocolates and she thanked him for saving her life and apologized for the trouble that she caused. But that was one of the really good news stories in uh, the treatment cases. Um, and the, just to, to note as well that the, the courts don't make blanket orders in relation to all aspects of a person's life. They try to make a minimal incursion into a person's autonomy. In this case here, there was just one order that the person couldn't live in their house. That was the order, but there were, which is a big deal, but unfortunately he was living in squalor and um, he wouldn't have survived another winter. But that was the one order that was made. Uh, and there's no other orders impacting on his life. Now I'm conscious that uh, it's coming up to 1325. So I, the, the end of life decisions are interesting. We're awaiting a judgment um, for where there's a conflict between uh, a mother of a child and a medical team in relation to whether or not the child's life should be um, maintained. Um, I, they're, they're very, very difficult cases, but the point I suppose I wanted to make about these is that when the court is, the court is when the court does get involved in these cases, the court tries to apply a subjective test, as in what would the person themselves want, not necessarily what. Um, obviously, bearing in mind what the medical opinion is and what the parents' opinion is, or whatever the conflict might be, but a subjective test is applied what would the person themselves have wanted? So that's important in terms of substituted decision-making. So this goes on to the, uh, through the facts of that case um, and, and a second case uh, along that line as well. And this is um, again, another example of how wardship has been used. It has been used to detain persons um, and there are detention orders being made on a re relatively regular basis. Um, you can make detention orders obviously under the Mental Health Act, but it's also possible to have detention orders under wardship, and these need to be reviewed every six months uh, and to ensure that the person gets proper appropriate oversight and safeguards uh, to the deprivation of liberty. Um, and again, that's quite, there's quite a lot of material there, which I won't be going through. But the Supreme Court endorsed that uh, approach. Um, so this was a point about deprivation of liberty. Um, it is possible and permissible to detain a person, but there has to be um, a lawful regime around that. Um, and this is an interesting and important decision of AC, which concerned a lady in a hospital who wanted to leave or her family wanted her to leave. And the hospital uh, felt that that would be unsafe. And it was, I think, their, their right decision that it would be unsafe. But it was it's, it's essentially the point of this decision is that where you have somebody who does not have capacity and remember the jurisdiction cannot be invoked invoked unless the person has incapacity and that has been established to some extent by opinion uh, so once a person uh, doesn't have capacity to make the decision then the decision could potentially be made for them but uh, you can't just uh, stop them without getting um, authority from a court you can do it on the basis of doctrine of medical necessity for a short period of time but the finding in the court was that only uh, it should that detention of under the doctrine of medical necessity should last no longer than is necessary to take take appropriate legal steps okay so if you have a situation where somebody hasn't got capacity and is looking to leave an institution and it doesn't have to be a psychiatric institution then you should be applying to get appropriate orders to to stop them and this is just wardship and a functional approach to capacity it's kind of interesting and this is really don't wait for the assisted decision making act to come in if there are uh, matters that are required to be addressed for a person who doesn't have capacity you can, you shouldn't wait this this is a kind of cautionary tale around that and this is my own um, personal bugbear um i am if anybody out there is listening to me has any influence on the repeal of the Marriage of Lunatics Act uh, 1811. <laughs> I would ask that that could be done because there are so many wards uh, who have the capacity to marry and have, um, you know, 
loving relationships, but they can't because they're awards. And this really needs to be um, repealed because it's a, an outright ban, essentially, on awards being married. Now, I'm going to stop there. I think that brings me to the end. Yeah of my slides and sorry for running over I hope no, to have you're a few great. more minutes. That, that's fantastic Anya. I mean it's really in-depth concise analysis of, of a really important matter so thank you very much. There are one or two questions there some of them are, are one of them is that uh, they've has the new functional test been implemented? Um, no under the assisted decision making act no that section of the legislation has not been enacted but um, it is and co under common law, the functional approach to capacity has long since been recognised. And we're all familiar with Banks v Goodfellow, which is the test for capacity for making a will. And that particular person had a mental disorder, um, but uh, that did not, um, he did have the capacity, that didn't bar him from making a, a valid will. So the functional approach to capacity is long been recognised by the courts we apply it and try to apply it in our practice uh, there, there's there's another question there and i know we're kind of moving on at a time but from uh, Eamon there i don't know whether you could see it on your on your panel can you no not, no not so if you have a beneficiary whose parent leaves her money on trust until age 21 mm. but uh, the sole beneficiary of the trust is incapable of managing her affairs are you saying that court will unlikely invoke the inherent jurisdiction of the court to effectively extend the trust and then require wardship application. I think that I, I don't have the full, I can't see that full question. It seems quite complex, yeah. but yeah. Um, and another one as well, which maybe I'll forward to you outside of this. The, because the point is really um, the court is absolutely reluctant to use inherent jurisdiction uh, where there is a statutory regime. So I think if you have any um, situation where the person has monies and there isn't a proper framework set up, then you have to you'd have to apply in wardship. Just lost me glasses. <laughs> All right, um, and lastly, there, uh, your book was it originally due for a publication earlier this year. <laughs> when when it when it, when is it coming out? <laughs> is that a question from somebody in the it is, audience? Yes, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> eagerly awaited. Yeah, the well, we are. Obviously, the 2015 Act has been pushed out, so I would have wanted to um, have that published at the same time as the legislation being commenced. Um, so the we're it's been, I suppose, we're looking now more at what's happening in practice and trying to provide guidance for somebody um, in practice with the current framework. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Listen, guys, we're, we're out of time. Many thanks to Anya for, for, for a, great, a great lecture there. You can see yeah. on, on the screen there the up and coming. Uh, we've got Nick Jervis next week, uh, the law firm growth formula, so a slightly different uh, subject matter. And then Bill Holohan is coming the week after with regards to uh, professional indemnity insurance uh, renewal. So we look forward to, to next week. Anya, thanks a million again. You're uh, welcome. And we'll talk, talk soon. Thanks very right. much. Uh, hopefully we'll see everybody next week. Bye.